Hello everyone and welcome to the Adam Kiss Show. Today we have a very special episode for you. I'm going to be talking about the conception of the process of making as well as post-production of my recent feature film, My Last Words. And if you've followed me from the beginning, I've talked in depth about sections of the process. I've talked about the process of shooting it or how I got the idea, but it's always been separate and in little fragmented parts. So I wanted to take one episode to fully go through my process from beginning to end from conceiving of the idea, writing the script, uh, assembling the cast and crew, finally getting to the fun part of shooting it, and uh, finally in post-production where we find ourselves now. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this. And before we start, I'll add that I'm on all social media. So definitely follow me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, uh, all the social media platforms out there. Okay, let's jump right into it. So I'll start by saying that I got the idea for this feature film on Christmas Day of 2022. Um, it's just an idea that came to me, not fully formed, obviously, as they often don't. I believe Steven Spielberg mentions how ideas never really come fully formed and, you know, it's almost like they're whispering to you and you really have to listen hard. Um, I think that's so true. Uh, similar In a similar manner, David Lynch, he always talked about when you are looking for big ideas and he, he likens the whole idea to a fish. So he says that when you're looking for a great idea, sometimes you have to go into deeper water to catch the big fish. And I, I think that's so true. I think it, it really is a great metaphor. Uh, for me, I had this kind of kernel of an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, I immediately was inspired, immediately started writing the script. Uh, the first draft, I would say, was finished in roughly two days. It was probably only about 90 pages, which actually, funnily enough, is pretty long for a script these days. Scripts are getting much shorter. I mean, I'm used to um, a lot of the scripts I've read from the past that were 120 plus pages, you know, 120, 130, 140, and that was totally normal back in the day. Uh, but nowadays, a lot of studios, they, they like to see 90 to 120 pages, which is in a certain way, soul crushing. I mean, there is a point uh, to the fact that something can be overwritten and oftentimes you can cut scenes and oftentimes it will be a better movie. But um, movies like The Godfather, you can't imagine them being under 120 pages. And I can't imagine really cutting scenes from The Godfather uh, or so many movies like that. I mean, you couldn't imagine Citizen Kane being made today. Made today. Uh, that was not even necessarily an extra long screenplay. It could have been. It's been a while since I've uh, looked at it, but um, the running time was only about two hours. And, and oftentimes with these movies, the running time was often two hours, though the script was much longer. Um, and it depends, obviously, the detail you go into in descriptions or if it's a shooting script, uh, which version of a script you're seeing, whether it's just a spec script or a shooting script, they're very different things. But I was writing this project on spec, obviously. I love to write on spec. Um, I think that's really the best thing that... Uh, screenwriters can do, at least as a screenwriter myself, that's the best thing I feel I can do is write on spec. And for those of you not familiar with that term, that just means that writing something that nobody told you to write, it was your own idea, you're not being necessarily commissioned to write it. And that's really what writing on spec is. So um, I was very passionate about it. I churned it out in a few days. And uh, then immediately, as I was writing, I should say, I was thinking of writing it in a low budget way, a uh, few characters, few locations, so that when I finished it, I said, okay, I'm ready to shoot. So I immediately started assembling a crew and a cast. I, I kind of did both at the same time. I put out casting notices. Um, I started interviewing people and uh, assembling a crew. Uh, I interviewed every single person who I brought onto the crew. So I handpicked absolutely everyone um, and for casting as well. Uh, so that was a fun process. It was an interesting process of um, finding all the people. We had a huge crew uh, for an independent project. I would say on average every day, just for crew, we had about 17 people, um, in addition to actors and, and a couple of extra people around. But I would say we had roughly 17 people, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the day, depending on where we were shooting, what we were shooting for that day. It varied a little bit, but the core members of our crew were always the same. 
Um, so it was a long planning process. As fast as the script came, the planning process was much longer. Um, I went through a couple more rewrites uh, and I, I didn't wait to rewrite the script and then assemble a cast and crew. I just felt the best process would be just get right into it and do both at the same time. You know, cast the picture, uh, assemble the crew and continue with revisions. So I kept revising. Uh, I was not in any rush here. I did it for a couple of months. And then finally, uh, I kind of narrowed it down with casting. I narrowed it down with the crew. And uh, really the, the next big step was once I had solidified the crew and the cast, it was kind of rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. I'm um, definitely a big believer in rehearsing uh, in film. Now, that's not always the case. Certain directors like Ridley Scott hates to rehearse. Um, so several directors don't like rehearsing, several do. Perhaps because of my theater background, I do prefer to rehearse. I do believe there's something in repetition, which is great. It actually frees you up uh, and lets you be more spontaneous the more you've repeated something. Because obviously I was working with something that was completely scripted. There was little to no improv in the script. Uh, basically all the scenes were as written. And that means that you can't just go off the wall and just start saying what's on your mind. So you can't be free in that sense. So you have to go the other way and know the material so well that you are totally free with it. I know that Al Pacino has talked about that so much, that acting is really all about repetition. Um, Anthony Hopkins, funny story about him. He reads every script he's in 250 times. He has this quirk, it has to be 250 times, not 249. Uh, probably he wouldn't mind if it was 251, but uh, at least 250 times. Now, I actually find that surprising because in film, as many of you I'm sure know, or if you don't know, I'm gonna tell you now, but in film, the interesting thing is that scripts change all the time. I mean, the joke is that you never really know the script is solidified until the morning of when you're shooting that particular scene and you see a copy of the, the newest script and you, you see probably a couple of changes, um, which is interesting. Uh, definitely it's the opposite of theater where you have a month or more to rehearse the play beforehand. You really get it ingrained. And that's really the main difference between theater and film TV is that uh, in theater, a lot of people expect you to come into the first rehearsal and totally open, not necessarily knowing your character. Whereas in film TV, uh, you're often expected to really know your character uh, because you're going to be shooting and there's not much rehearsal. Uh, likely there will not be much rehearsal, at least not as much as in theater. Um, I understand both methods of working. I like both method methods of working. I mean, sometimes it's great to go in with no rehearsal and just, and you might get something magical on the first take. Absolutely have no problem with that. And I think it's a great thing. But uh, especially with a project like this, I was so passionate about it. I wanted to get it right. So I felt that we should do a lot of exploring in rehearsal and then uh, come to a final consensus with the other um, actors, actresses on how it, how it, how the scene could play out. And the great thing is that in rehearsal, you can discuss things with everyone. Um, you really get to know people too. I find that's the most important is just talking with my fellow performers. I was in a unique position because I was the director of this picture, but I was also an actor in it, uh, also the writer and a producer as well, um, Christina Kiss, was obviously uh, another producer uh, who I couldn't have done this without. Uh, but uh, it was interesting to have all those hats on me in production. Uh, obviously, Christina Kiss was also my mom. Uh, she took a lot of the weight off of me and I'm very thankful for that. It was, uh, things went much more smoothly having her around and on set to take care of things that I necessarily couldn't always think of. And uh, that's why it's so important to pick good people, good people who can take some of the weight off of you as a director, especially if you're also an actor. Um, so finding good people you trust is absolutely important. I would say do not rush that process. That's just as important as a good script, I would say. Because you can have a great script, but if you don't have a great team, uh, it's possible it won't come to fruition the way you envision it. Um, it's important to have people who obviously bring ideas to the table, but also people who will listen to you, listen to your vision at the end of the day. That's the, the number one thing. I mean, for me, I have a very clear vision of what I want, but then I'm very open. So when I was rehearsing with uh, other actresses in the roles, I was always open to their suggestions, open to what their thoughts were. 
And then at the end of the day, uh, I decided what I liked better. Um, but I felt it was important for me to be open to new ideas, even though I wrote the script <laughs> and I, I knew it so well. But oftentimes other people can point out things to you that you don't notice when you're so close to it. Uh, it's really interesting how it's something that you wrote but someone else with fresh eyes can totally bring new light to it. So there's obviously moments like that. There's moments where uh, as a director, you say, no, you know, I'd definitely like to go in this direction instead. And that's all great. And then the beauty is that on sets, we definitely were not rushing things. Um, for an indie film, we were actually going at a surprisingly leisurely pace, I would say. We were not going hectic and frantic. We definitely made sure in our coverage to get roughly four takes, you know, of each particular shots, um, sometimes more, a couple of times less, obviously, uh, if it didn't warrant it. But um, once we got the first few takes, I would always tell people, let's experiment, let's do something new, we got that. Uh, and sometimes I would give a specific direction, and then other times I would say, you know what, let's just have fun with it, let's just see what happens. And oftentimes that's my favorite thing, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, some of those takes we haven't completed the editing of the movie yet, but some of those takes have definitely ended up in the final product. And I definitely believe in just going with the flow. I believe in having a plan, making a meticulous plan, spending hours and hours planning, and then throwing it all out the window. <laughs> if you could encapsulate my beliefs, that would probably be a good way to describe them. I mean, I am definitely more into improv than certain people are. Certain people like to have a plan and stick to it, and no matter what, they're going to stick to the plan. But I, I get on set and I say, yeah, this is great, but you know, if we move a little bit there, I know we weren't planning on that location, but if we go over there, that's more interesting. Or, you know, what if we do the scene this way instead of that way? I, I, just, I just love moments like that or the magic. Um, and sometimes your crew can get annoyed with that kind of thing. And, you know, I just love it. I, I love changing things up. It's something that I don't think I'll ever stop doing. Now, obviously, we stuck to the plan with a lot of things. We spent, I spent at least 50 hours, you know, planning out everything uh, with various members of crew, in person, on Zoom, phone calls, and any which way we could. Um, so I'm definitely a big believer in planning and also throwing it out the window. Uh, so speaking of, by this point, I'd been doing a lot of planning, a lot of rehearsing. And I was getting to the point where production was nearing. Um, <laughs> and uh, I love being overwhelmed. I think that being overwhelmed is the best thing you can be because it really tests your strength. And it's really true what they say that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And uh, it's definitely true with this. Now, because I had so many hats, I obviously had help. But um, I was worried about, you know, renting the equipment, uh, getting the insurance for the equipment, you know, making sure to transport all the equipment, uh, making sure that everyone was going to show up, you know, reminding everyone, you know, every day when we're starting, sending out group emails, uh, talking about my vision with everybody. Uh, the few days before production, I basically didn't sleep, didn't eat, didn't sleep, didn't do anything, just breathe the production, you know, eat, breathe, sleep the production. Um, there was nothing else going on in my life at that point. Um, and so I was very close to it. I was very in tune with it. And finally, we started production in Manhattan. Uh, great day. And uh, there's always a couple of hiccups in production, which is, which is always interesting because things never go to plan anyway, which is why you have to be adaptable. You, you have to be willing to say, okay, let, let's, let's go to this location because there's construction going on there. Like, for example... Um, one location that we were planning to shoot the very first day, we noticed that all of a sudden overnight they put up some construction there. Um, so uh, another time um, we were planning to move to another location and there were barricades up because uh, the president was literally in town and we didn't know and uh, they were barricading off an entire avenue and it took us hours to get to a new location and we could barely bring any equipment at all. And it's, it's really those kind of moments that you have to expect. Expect the unexpected. Uh, that is so true, especially in filmmaking. Just expect, in other words, it's Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. But I'll add a caveat to that, that something going wrong does not necessarily mean that it's for the worse. A lot of times mistakes or things that you don't intend to happen can end up being blessings. I mean, just think in your life, uh, how many things that at first you thought were problems and catastrophes, and in the end it ended up working out 
and maybe even working out for the better. I just love that. I love when that happens. Uh, it's really a, a beautiful thing. And that's the magic of the movies, really. Just un the unexpected things that pop up. I mean, it's so true often that people say that you can't make a great movie. You can have all the great individual elements. You can have great cinematography, great direction, great performances. Uh, everyone, everyone, you know, great wardrobe, a great script. You can have all of that. But a lot of times those can be separated and may not mesh all together and come as one. But for the really great movies, they almost have to happen by accident. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't work hard. Uh, and But I am saying that luck does have something to do with it. You know, and people don't like to hear that. You know, that people like to say that, oh, you make your own luck. Yes, you make your own luck. And that if you are prepared, you have everything going for you. You have a great script. You have great cinematography, great acting, great performances, all of that. Then you can wait to be lucky or not. You know, but without that, you're probably not going to make a great movie. But in a certain way, you have to do everything the best you can and then just kind of let go and hope for the best. Um, I think what people don't like is that there isn't that much under your control with a movie. I mean, as a director, I try not to be a control freak. I mean, there's certain people who have been, you know, very controlling of their movies, who have made great movies. I mean, uh, certain names like Kubrick uh, come to mind. He was absolutely in control. And when he didn't get what he wanted, he kept doing the same scene for a week if he had to, to get it. Now, I'm a little bit more relaxed on that. Maybe not to the extent of Clint Eastwood, where his motto is get two good takes and then move on and don't waste anyone's time. Um, I would say I fall in between that, um, probably more on the side of less takes, because I think there's kind of a law of diminishing returns with takes, you know. Once you get to take six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, it kind of diminishes, I think, in the performances. The actors lose their energy, um, the crew gets tired and bored, and it kind of lowers the energy of everything, um, which you don't want. Now, um, you can always obviously take a break, try to regroup, um, do things like that. But with a, an indie project, you don't always have that luxury. Uh, thankfully, we never really moved on from a scene when I wasn't happy with it. Uh, sometimes with my, uh, with my cinematographer, I decided just to, like, for example, let me give you an example. So there was this one scene that we almost were running out of time. We had to shoot it outside before dark. It was golden hour. We were losing the light every second. And I said, why don't we just do a long shot here? Just a, a big wide shot. And uh, we did a couple takes of that. And then just for safety, I had them do a couple of like one or two takes of a close up. But that's definitely a shot that I'm envisioning as a, as a very wide shot in the film. And uh, it was not something that we had necessarily envisioned that way, but just in the heat of the moment, as I saw time slipping away from me, I decided on that. And I think it ended up great. And it was actually one of my favorite scenes and one of the most artistic shots. Uh, so you never know when things are like that. Um, I do not fully storyboard. I definitely shot list, a full shot list. I believe that's important. Uh, storyboards, I've, I know Hitchcock was a big believer in them. Uh, they're not necessarily something I'm opposed to. It's something that I didn't do for this project. I'm obviously open in the future. Uh, I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts on that. Uh, whether if you're a filmmaker, do you believe in storyboards or not? Um, so feel free to comment about that. But as for me, I haven't used them yet. I like the fact that I go in with a full shot list. So a full plan, but still with the opportunity to be surprised. I, I feel like Perhaps with a shot list, you may get a little too locked in. Uh, and also, we were not working with uh, sets. We were working in real locations. So um, I know storyboards are particularly useful if you have a built set. Um, and they can absolutely save time. Uh, and they can absolutely communicate the vision. You know, maybe the director doesn't have to talk as much on set, you know, because they, they understand the vision. But I just don't like being tied down and, and the limitations of it. So... I guess I'm 50-50 on storyboards. Uh, maybe someone can convince me otherwise. Um, so we started shooting these scenes. I had talked with the other actresses um, beforehand about some minimal blocking, uh, but not too much. Uh, it was mostly about the performances, about the scenes. And then in terms of blocking, I mean, unless 
it was a car scene and I, I talked to them, okay, then, then we're going to be in the car here and then we're going to get out here and stuff like that. And those things often varied on set based on what we planned. But um, I would tell things like that and we'd, you know, try some limited physicality in rehearsals. Uh, both I was rehearsing both on Zoom and occasionally in person, uh, which I feel is important. Um, in our modern era, it's so easy to just do Zoom and not have that physical uh, connection with a scene partner, but I feel it's so important to at least uh, rehearse once with your scene partner uh, before you're filming in person, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting process uh, to make a film like this. So basically we shot all these scenes, we weren't rushing, we weren't going too slow either, we were kind of going at a sweet spot, uh, which I, I really loved. And uh, basically, yeah, we were doing about 10 hour days, sometimes 12 hour days, um, once in a while, a little more even, which was, you know, interesting. Uh, it was, sometimes we, we started early and then we had one day where we had to do a night shoot. So everyone had to stay a little bit late uh, to get it in. Um, we were absolutely <laughs> um, working very hard uh, to make this happen. I put a lot of passion into it. I know I did. And um, it was it was really a very rewarding experience to film it. I mean, so many directors say that they actually hate the process of filming, of being on set, because, you know, you have to get up early in the morning. You probably go to bed late. You barely get any sleep. You know, everyone's asking you 10 million questions every second, and you have to give a snap answer like that. And that's that's another aspect to directing, is that I believe that, as Teddy Roosevelt said, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The second best thing you can do is the wrong thing. And the absolute worst thing you can do is nothing. So basically what that means is any decision is better than no decision. And I'm a firm believer in that. You know, even a wrong decision is better than no decision at all. So, you know, people would come up to me a million times to ask questions. Oh, are we using this? Are we using that? I gave them a decision. Okay, we're doing that. And then, you know, you should stick to it. But if you feel it's not working, don't out of pride, just stick to it. And, and you can feel free to change course and say, okay, you know what, let's try that. Or, you know, there, were, there was one particular moment when um, there was a crucial decision about whether to shoot um, one of two scenes uh, for the rest of the day. And uh, well, the, the decision was, there was two scenes, both of them which were set at night. And I had to decide which one to move to the day because we didn't have the time to set up the equipment for a fake night outside. Uh, funnily enough, we did set up oftentimes one day, it was pouring rain all day. We set up lights outside, outside the two story windows and everything. So it looks just as sunny as ever. Um, it was totally controlled. Um, so we did do things like that, but um, I had to decide which one to change to, to day versus night. So I just made a decision. Uh, we changed that to day and I'm very happy we did. And then we ended up shooting the night scene later, which absolutely made sense. So all of this is to say that Listen, you cannot make a wrong decision. I don't care what anyone else says. There are no wrong decisions. And that's really my philosophy in life. There is no real right and wrong. I mean, obviously there are extreme examples of that. And yes, you know, there are things that are probably more right and more wrong. And yes, possibly this decision would have been better. This would have been worse. But at the end of the day, be proud of yourself that you made a decision. Uh, you stuck to it and that's, you stuck to your guns. And directing's all about sticking to your guns. Um, Really, I think um, so, so many directors have mentioned that. Uh, just stick to your guns, have the confidence to do it. And uh, yeah, you just have to, you're being a leader. That's really what it's about. You know, a director does everything and nothing. You know, so many, two directors can do to two totally different things. They're, they can be almost unrecognizable for the way they behave on set. Um, like, I think someone mentioned that Clint Eastwood, you know, if you were experienced in film production and you went onto the set in the first five minutes, you wouldn't necessarily know that he's the director. He's kind of a very quiet, laid back director who likes to watch. And then obviously there are moments when he gives his insight and uh, when something really matters to him, and then he makes that known. Whereas uh, certain other directors, um, I can imagine Kubrick coming to mind, would probably be, you know, a little more involved with, with every aspect and, you know, more giving orders and, you know, being more involved in every minute detail. So there is really no manual on how to be a director. You just call yourself a director and direct a film. Then you're a director. Simple as that. 
Um, it really is. Um, so many people have talked about that. Um, you really are what you say you are. You are what you continually do. And uh, I'm a big believer in that. So we 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 finished production um, in about, it was roughly two weeks of production. So I was happy that, that we did that. Uh, we, we rented the best lenses. Uh, we rented vintage lenses, uh, which were absolutely great, uh, vintage Zeiss lenses. I thought that they would give a great feel, old world feel uh, to the movie, which is definitely what I was going for. And another thing I should mention that I love classic old Hollywood cinema. And this was absolutely what I wanted to add a little bit of uh, with this film. The whole idea I had was classic style with a modern twist. That really encapsulates my vision perfectly for this. I mean, I was inspired by so many of my favorite movies, uh, so many of my favorite, favorite, um, favorite, uh, the, the movies that were shot so beautifully, the movies with my favorite cinematography, I should say. Um, and I believe that some of that is missing today. I, I miss that kind of old style look, whereas in often in a lot of shows and things today, everything can kind of look the same. And uh, th that's great too. I mean, the modern look is absolutely great. Uh, I'm glad about it, but I'm definitely a fan of the old style cinema as well as the old style editing where you don't cut every three seconds. You don't cut back and forth between the close-ups for the entire conversation. Maybe you let a medium shot rest for a little bit. You know, that's the old style, like in Citizen Kane or Casablanca, where you'd see this wide shot play out for a whole scene. I mean, what has happened to that these days? That, that's what I'd like to ask. I, I'd love to bring some of that back. And yes, I'm a big fan of close-ups as well. I mean, the, the Bergman close-up is so classic. It, it really inspired me. I, I love close-ups. I heavily utilize them. But I also like to mix it up you know, with some wide shots, some things that you can let those scenes sit without cutting. Um, I feel like, you know, in today, in the, in the video game world of today, um, just attention spans are so short that you have to keep cutting and cutting. Um, and it's funny for me to say that because I've never once in my life played a video game. I, I just do not like video games. I was always more into literature, reading, all of that. Um, Never could stand video games, stand playing it. When I saw other people playing them, I always said, no thanks, not for me. I'll go back home and read some Tolstoy. Um, so that was always kind of, um, maybe I'm peculiar in that, and I just like those older takes, um, those older films with, with longer takes, I should say. Um, I don't know. It's just my personal taste, I guess, but uh, it's something that I enjoy. I think it honestly can add to dramatic tension when you don't cut. You know, when you're you're saying, you're almost expecting it to cut already. You know, when, when a scene has been on a long take for a long time, and maybe not much is happening, maybe maybe nothing is really happening, but you know, that kind of builds tension, kind of the, the longer, the longer you can keep the take. And I know that there, there have been almost scientific, you know, experiments of long takes, like in Hitchcock's Rope, he used roughly you know, 10 minute takes, you know, for the entire movie. Um, and that was, I, probably he would have tried to do the entire movie in one take if he could, but that, at that time there were technical limita limitations, so he couldn't do that. Uh, but there have been a lot of movies in recent years that have tried that whole one take in a movie method or a couple of takes. And, and oftentimes today that they'll try to seamlessly integrate it so it looks like it's not a take. I mean, so it looks like it's not a cut but it really is, and obviously sometimes you can spot those more than others. Um, yeah, so we did filming, we, we, we wrapped on filming, and then really the process is editing it, uh, which we're in now. Um, I'm definitely, you know, supervising that, giving my notes on that. Um, it's always an interesting process. I mean, they say that a script is written three times, when it's actually written, when it's filmed, and when it's edited. And that's really so true because each step of the process, you can make an entirely different movie. And each step of the process, you can envision an entirely different movie. And um, each step of the process, you can be right with your choices, even though they're totally different. Um, oftentimes, you can find that the finished product is nothing like what you originally conceived of. Or sometimes you can find that it is exactly what you conceived of, though I'm sure that's actually pretty rare. Um, I think for me, it is fairly close to how I conceived it. Um, how I conceived the idea originally. I think I came actually very close to that, which I'm happy about. And then obviously, as we talked about, we added a bunch of stuff and uh, I'm very happy about that as well. But um, yeah, it's 
Filmmaking is like a war. Making a movie is like a war. There's always a problem. There's always an obstacle. Those obstacles make you stronger. They make you better. They make you a better filmmaker, a better screenwriter, better actor, better director, better anything. And that just isn't true for filmmaking. That's true for life in general. No matter if you do something enough, you're going to get better at it. That's just a law of the universe. I mean, no matter what it is you dedicate yourself to, if you continue to dedicate yourself to it, continue to plow forward, you're going to get better. There's just no doubt about that. And I, I honestly dare anyone to refute that claim. That's how, if you work hard on something, you continue working hard every single day on that goal, uh, no matter what, even if it's incrementally, you will get better. And I think that that's really a good way to end today's episode. It was wonderful to talk to all of you. Definitely find me on Instagram, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, all the social media platforms. And I'll be here to talk to you again sometime soon. Have a great day, everyone. See you.